over the top of Anderson. Over Anderson. Cracks all the way back it in, it does. And he's locked in! What a goal! Hi, I'm Richard Amon. Thanks for joining DSR TV, the showcase of inclusive sport. Hope you enjoy today's action, seeing what's possible for people with disability playing sport. So you can catch up a lot of action on our website, www.dsr.org.au, for a whole host of past episodes of DSR TV to see inclusive sport for people with a disability. the table. Um, we'll run through a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Of course, I'd like to welcome you to the Victorian Sport and Recreation Inclusion and Diversity Community of Practice. Um, really appreciate everybody taking their time out of their days today to, to come together um, and join forces to share success stories, um, trials and tribulations, aspirations for the future, and maybe even a few failures and, and things that you wish had happened but, but didn't. Um, I think by coming together today, there's an incredible um, amount of knowledge in the room today. Um, I'll just ask Adam and Grant to um, go around very covertly and put small pieces of paper, um, if they brought the paper, on tables. And we'll have a little activity in a few minutes. Um, so let's get started here. Um, a reminder as much for myself as for anyone else that we are live uh, thanks to My Sport Live. Um, so hopefully people in Mildura and, and Swan Hill and anywhere else can tune in and ask questions via the AAA Play Facebook page that um, set from AAA Play and RecLink is monitoring. So no swearing, don't say anything controversial, and don't say anything that you don't want recorded and repeated definitely because we are definitely online. Make yourself comfortable today. Come and go as you please. Make phone calls um, outside if you like. Um, step into the hallway. Um, it's certainly not a, a lecture. You want to be comfortable. We're here for several hours together. Um, the bathrooms, including accessible washrooms, are just outside. Uh, turn to the right and then to the left. Um, I was able to attend a, an SDO forum, and I'll never say it as well as Hanny, Hannah Muncy um, articulated it, but feel free to ask questions of the presenters. Um, if it comes from a place of learning and, and curiosity, the questions are fantastic. And so feel free to, to ask questions. We aim for what's called a psychologically safe environment. You can ask questions, have some great conversations without fear of being judged that that was a silly question or anything like that. So I know most of you, um, and I know that you guys are the best audience um, around. And a huge thank you to um, two of the presenters who will present in the afternoon who came up um, upon very um, short notice. But I said, don't worry, this is the best audience you can present in front of. Um, as you have came in and registered, um, you should have received a name tag we're trying something a little bit new um, to have a visual representation of the groups that you work with. And so you would have hopefully had a highlighter, just put a stroke through your name, or, or use those colors to represent the cohorts that you work with. Of course, today, the point of coming together is that we don't just see cohorts. We don't see people with autism. We don't see people with disability. We don't see people with LGBTQI, because we want to see um, 
how all of that interacts together and how it all interrelates. And we'll hear presentations later from Pete, for example, about older people. Of course, those older people are extremely diverse within um, gymnastics as well and all of the presentations. So I'm really looking forward to hearing the stories that everybody shares. Um, I don't know how well you can see that. Hopefully the Aboriginal flag um, shows up, but it is with that storytelling um, aspect in mind that I think we should pay our respects to the oldest continuous culture on earth. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting on and anyone who is joining us via live stream. We recognize Aboriginal people's continuing connection to the land, the water, and community. And I'd like to personally pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future, and to anyone who is present with us here today. I had the um, opportunity to listen to an elder do a welcome to country in Sydney, and they shared the story about when you come onto country, um, you are not allowed to talk, you're not allowed to access any of the resources, you don't access any of the food or water when you come on country until you're given a ticket, and that ticket uh, was in the shape of a gum leaf. And once you receive that gum leaf, then you're able to access the resources and hear the stories. And so I think that when you attend a conference or a forum like this today, it is a big chunk of it is sharing resources. It's sharing those stories and it's sharing um, the things that you've learned over the last several years. I've thought a lot about this uh, idea of what is a community of practice, probably more than um, any person should. <laughs> it started off uh, probably a decade ago when I was working at Autism Victoria and Department of Health and Human Services told us run a community of practice for autism practitioners. And we were really kind of at a loss of what that looked like and what it, what it turned out to be. And the way that my thinking has evolved is, um, and something I want to be quite assertive as, about is that today is not a community of practice. Today is a forum. But what happens after today, that is what becomes the community of practice, when we create those networks and when we all come together. So a community of practice can take many forms. It can be in the form of a photo competition, like we ran with Tennis Victoria, um, to show some of the participation opportunities that are already happening. We don't always have to reinvent the wheel. We don't always have to be innovative. Sometimes we can just display what's already happening, because we know it's harder to be what you can't see. It might be sharing best practice um, at a parent-friendly event, such as a family fun day, which is coming up, um, to recognize World Autism Awareness, Acceptance Awesome Day, um, April 11th at Hanson Reserve. If you attended the community of practice um, across the road at Champions Room and you listened to Cade Matthews speak about the Southern Lights um, ice hockey team, what's really cool, and this was the exact idea that I hope for was that following communities of practice and following that face-to-face -face forum, we could increase the dissemination of information of those incredible programs. And the crew from the Southern Lights um, have been featured in a podcast from the BBC, which has gone out to tens of thousands of listeners. It could be um, a podcast such as the new MRI, MCRI concussion podcast. So many of you in the sport and recreation sector, you want to know concussion best practice, so you can go to that. It could be in a video um, and online modules such as those from Play by the Rules and Sport um, Special Olympics Australia. Um, it could be bringing everyone together at the Australian Open. This is a really cool opportunity um, thanks to the team at Tennis Victoria and Tennis Australia who organized this for a group of kids with autism to come together on, on court on the your left side um, and kids, to kids, teenagers and adolescents to come together from the Horn of Africa tennis program out of Carlton Gardens. So a really awesome opportunity for parents to just come together, kids, and to demonstrate what's possible together. Um, it could be showing a video. So especially when we think about accessibility and the way we share information, um, not everyone can be here with us. People have lives, people have jobs, people have kids to look after. So um, one of the coolest programs, and I mean cool, um, is this from Disability Winter Sports Australia, as it loads up there. And so this is Jane. Um, 
I'll let you tell, I'll let her tell you. The days start getting shorter and the weather's starting to get miserable. Everybody wonders why at work I'm so happy. It's because like, like, but it's snowing in the mountains. <laughs> I think it's really hard for all of us to see someone struggle with something. But sometimes you have to let people make a few mistakes and you've also sometimes got to take a step back. Something like DWA, it embodies everything I think is important about rehab. And that is rehab is about returning to the joy in one's life. I think you've got to really make sure you've got some connection with your participant before you even start. And some people might have a really different idea of what they want to get out of the day or what they see the day being about than you do. Good communication is not about rushing people. It's about making them feel confident and comfortable that they've got time to get out what they need to say or what they need to get through to you. And they really to know that you're actually listening. You've got to let people get out there by themselves again and have that confidence to do that. Okay, I might have a few stacks, okay? I might have a few crashes in the snow or whatever, but I really want to be able to get as independent as I can. And I want to know that you're not helping me too much. You've actually sometimes got to let them make a few mistakes. So eventually, you might get down the bottom of the slope and you might say, hey, did you realise you actually just did that by yourself? And I was just pretending to be there. And they go, what? <laughs> and then when you do that one run where you're like, oh, I did that turn, or I did three turns in a row and I didn't stack, like make the goals small for yourself, then you feel even more ecstatic. It's all about improvisation and the attitude that you will make something work. And that is great to be around because with DWA, everybody who's up there has this can-do attitude. They, they've really got the heart in the right place and that's a really positive environment to be volunteering. It's, it's amazing, you know, and everyone just wants to have fun. I mean, that's great. <laughs> that's what life's about. Oh, I feel like I've learned a lot about myself. <laughs> I suppose one thing is that you're always thinking about someone else before yourself and it brings out the best in humanity really and that's that's what it's taught me yeah it makes me a positive person and just to see people like just so like not just happy i'm smiling but ecstatically happy you know just like oh, oh you know that was amazing you know Pretty awesome. Um, so you can easily tell the um, joy and excitement that, um, that Jane brings as a volunteer for DWA. Just have to... Just have to troubleshoot some tech things here. All right. Um, we have a little activity. Um, so we just get some markers and pens if you don't have um, any. So maybe Jason and Jess and 
anyone. But what I wanted to be able to demonstrate from this activity is that whether you've been in this sector for a couple of weeks, and there's probably some people in this room that are new to the sport and recreation sector, but maybe they come from a disability sector, or maybe they're here more in uh, the capacity of somebody with lived experience of disability, which of course um, could be from the time that they've acquired a disability or perhaps they were born with it. Um, coming together and having that synergy and that ability to share is really incredible. Um, and often I've guessed at how many years we've got experience in this sector, and you're gonna hear from some incredible speakers today who have some exceptional um, experience and many years in the sector. So just over the next two minutes um, at your tables, meet your table mates that you're gonna be sitting with for the next hour or so, introduce yourself, and on the piece of paper in the center of your table, write down how many years experience, what would you say, how many years have you been in the sector for? We've got four people at the moment, um, and it's recorded, so we'll, you know, it's more about the on-demand aspect, I suppose, but um, being a state body, we should be able to help people that are not in Melbourne <laughs> and not expect everyone to drive in. Yeah. Environmentally, instead of having 50 people drive it, if you watch online, and, and not everyone wants to attend for the whole day, they can attend for a part of it, etc. So, yeah, it's very good. I think it's a good option. And the cost, it's, it's cheaper than catering. So, it makes sense to do it from a cost perspective, I would say. All right, everybody, add up the number of years' experience that you have. Put your hands up if you take, everyone put their hands up. And if your table has less than 10 years experience, put your hands down. If your table has less than 20 years experience, put your hands down. If your table has less than 30 years experience, put your hands down. If your table has less than 40 years experience, put your hands down. We got two tables, how many years experience for you guys, <laughs> how'd the addition go? 48 years of experience, and Emily's table in the back corner, 63. <laughs> um, 
but a great mix at the back. It's not all oldies. Um, <laughs> there's some young people there too. Um, and oh, Rosa, Rosa's table at the very back. Oh, welcome. How many years back there? I know that, yeah. Well, I know that uh, Rosa's been leading the inclusion and sport um, sector for a very long time. And so I think that was, I hope, that was a little bit of a fun way to get to meet the people that you're sitting with today. Um, in that little instance of IT bungling, I forgot to say that, um, you know, the work that DWA d does is, is incredible and that video with Jane really um, captures the spirit of what they do. Of course, at the same time, it also shows that incredible scenery of the Alpine region. Um, and we know that the Alpine region and the Grampians and a significant portion of the state have experienced um, horrendous bushfires um, for the better part of two months, two and a half months. And so just a quick note to say that our thoughts are with everybody um, that are affected and we hope that when the time is right, we already have the wheels in motion for the sport and recreation sector and for sport and recreation and racing to be coming together with multiple sports. Um, and so just a quick note to, to mention that we understand the impact that that has had and the trauma that that's caused and we hope that through the power of sport we can play some small role in the recovery of that. With that, I'd like to invite up our manager of diversity and inclusion in participation and sector development, Rachel Evans, to present about the Together More Active program and a few key points about what's new. And she'll be joined by Samantha Marshall from AAA Play. Please welcome both Rachel and Samantha. Thanks, Sean. Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to also start with an acknowledgement to country and to welcome our Aboriginal elders, past, present and future. Um, so just a bit of a straw poll before we start. Hands up in the room who is actually directly involved in a Together More Active project, just so we can see who's here. A small number. So for those who don't know what Together More Active is, it's our new grant program to the sector with two objectives of, first of all, sustaining and supporting the sector to continue its endeavours, but more importantly is to build participation for underrepresented groups, um, people with a disability, LGBTI, multicultural, Aboriginal, um, the list goes on. Um, so what's new in Together More Active? So working together for shared outcomes. Obviously, networking events like this is really important. Um, and well done to Sean for establishing the community of practice in recent years for SRV. It started out being a network specifically around autism and disability engagement, but increasingly we want to move it forward. And what today is about also is inviting people from across the sector who have interests in different community cohorts as well, that we know have different barriers to participation and are ultimately underrepresented in our participation statistics. Um, in the back of the room here, you may see some uh, summaries that we've posted up. This is basically giving a summary snapshot of all the projects funded through Together More Active by community cohort. Um, so you get to see a range of the projects that are being funded over the next two years. If you're not directly involved in one of those projects, but you have a particular passion or interest in one of those community cohorts, please take a look at the list. And on the top of that list, you'll see a contact telephone number. Get in touch with us because we'll be doing some further consultation with the sector to work out how we can improve better collaboration across the sector, um, you know, through networking events like this, but perhaps through smaller, more informal meetings as well. Um, community engagement and co-design. Essentially, what we want to know is how we can help you and support you to do this better. The more we can have people with lived experience being involved in our projects, 
the better the outcomes. So feedback to us. Um, there'll be some an evaluation form that's sent out uh, over the next couple of days. We're really keen to get your feedback as to not only you know, what you thought about today, but also to glean your ideas about what you want us to support through these forums into the future. So please, you know, be as wild and as imaginative as you want to be through those feedback mechanisms. Project control groups or steering groups are essentially one really simple way that we can be encouraging our new projects to ensure people with different lived experience can be involved in projects from the very early start and also to influence the design and the outcome throughout the projects. So that's something for the first time we have embedded in our funding agreements to ensure our funded organisations are thinking about engagement from the get-go. A couple of other things um, that I wanted to mention, and I won't steal Sam's thunder in relation to AAA play, but inclusion action plans um, are a really important way for organisations to reflect on where they currently stand in relation to all aspects of diversity and inclusion and what they want to achieve. So for the first time, um, well, as part of the first two years of funding, we're requiring that all organisations that have got a disability-specific project, that they are working on their inclusion action plans that can be disability-specific or broader than that. Obviously, with the concept of universal design and intersectionality, we want to work with organisations that think beyond little pockets of inclusion in isolation. Our intention is over the next four years to ensure that all organisations funded through Together More Active are working on their inclusion action plans. So watch this space. That's something we'll be communicating down the track. In relation to AAA Play, um, I want to say thank all of you who have used the AAA Play website as a promotion tool to promote your activities and clubs. Um, and it's fantastic um, with the, the way RecLink has been engaging the sector and working with the organisations. Um, through the funding agreements for the first time, we wanted to better cement and reinforce that opportunity to work more collaboratively with AAA Play. So for the first time, we've more explicitly set the expectation around organisations that if approached by AAA Play, will you know, do their best endeavour to support a participant patient outcome and with sport development officers working with individual clubs to make sure somebody's experience is as good as it can be on the ground, to make sure that the data is as up to date as possible. So when approached by RecLink Australia on a six monthly basis, that the funded organisations are working to ensure all the information is up to date. And um, thirdly, to you know, help cross-promote AAA play all the more um, by promoting it to affiliated clubs and associations. Um, so I think that's essentially all I wanted to say, unless there's any questions, and I'll hand over to Sam. Yeah. 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 Nice. So hi, I'm Sam from AAA Play. I've met a number of you, but looking forward to meeting many more. Um, so as Rachel said, we're basically here for you guys. She's very kindly said what we need from you to be able to promote your programs, but also really we're funded by SRV um, to help you guys out for free. So what basically we are is a one-stop portal for people with disability to find a sporting opportunity in their area. They can jump onto our website, go to a Find Our Activities um, page, chuck in their postcode, and all of the activities within a certain radius will come up around them. So that's all different sports. They can filter by sport, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but 90% of people don't search by sport. They just want to find an activity near them, and we are here to help them do that. We really want to get your activities in front of them. Um, so we are constantly updating our website as well to make sure it's as accessible and user-friendly as possible. Um, recently we've uh, included a translation model, so we've got Hindi, Simplified Chinese, Vietnamese and Somali on there now. Um, we just click a flag and it changes the language. We've also got ReadSpeaker on all pages, so um, people can understand it orally as well as visually. And there's also just very new feedback buttons, so if someone wants a different kind of program or there's nothing in their area, or they just want a different accessibility feature on the website that we haven't got to yet, they can let us know instantly and we'll get that and we'll start working on it immediately and get in contact with the sport if they're asking for a specific sport and saying there is a demand for this. So 
This graph just shows the demand for the service of AAA play. It's increased exponentially since we started in 2014. I've only been here since November, but even since then, the increase has been dramatic. Um, this shows total users um, over months, but we, so we've had um, a bit of a spike of, across Australia and in international um, visitors. And there's probably a number of reasons for that, but we also get around 2,500, 3,000 Victorians every 30 days new to the site. So that's a huge audience that you can advertise and promote your programs to um, and hopefully drive, drive more people accessing these aw awesome programs. Um, and then so as I said, they can find, they can filter by postcode and see what, the 700 programs on our database. So there's a huge, huge range there, but we always want more. Um, this is the graph that everyone wants to see. It's um, how many sports, well, how, how many people are searching for each sport. Um, but the most interesting statistic, as I said before, is that people aren't searching by specific sport. Um, I think it's just under the audio, the captions there, but the highest search result was for any sport, contributing to 2,625 unique page, page views over six months. So it doesn't matter what sport you're from. If you're from basketball, obviously there's a bit of a spike there, but if you're from the smallest sport as well, people are still going to be able to see that, find out about it, and hopefully come as well. So that's my contact details. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I've got um, an information pamphlet there. Um, if we also have opportunities, we send out a newsletter twice a month that goes to 1,300 subscribers. We've got 2,000 followers, on, more than 2,000 followers on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So we've got lots of ways to get your programs out there. I'd really love to hear from all of you. If you've got one-off come and try days, we can advertise those. If you want to get expressions of interest, we can also do that. We're basically here for you to get your program in front of as many people as possible. Um, so I look forward to meeting more of you today and um, working with you in the future. Thanks a lot. One more round of applause for Rachel and Sam. Thank you, big time. We'll just save questions until the end. Um, there's a 12 to 15 second lag for those who are watching online. So we'll save the questions until the end for the, for the panel so that anyone um, attending remotely can participate as much as possible. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to um, register for the AAA Play newsletter. If, um, if AAA is your, is your thing, um, definitely what I really love about it is the let's learn about and you get the more the deep dive into some of the incredible opportunities that are happening. I think that like anything, um, communicating is challenging. Um, and so in a perfect world, all the media, marketing, comms, people would be best mates. Um, and the first community of practice that we actually ran almost two years ago was focused on media and comms. Um, and so ideally, those networks and, um, can continue to foster. Um, incredible to see the number of um, hits that basketball has. Um, but I think it's not necessarily the hits. It's the, it's the quality, of course. And I'm really pleased that we have two people from uh, uh, an incredible program at Sandringham Netball um, club. So I'd like to welcome Amelia Matlock and Emily Higgins to present uh, the story of their netball club. Come on up. And they're dressed to impress. Thank you. Just, Just lucky we didn't bring a netball. <laughs> <laughs> Just press forward. No worries. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to speak today. Um, we've had a bit of a, an incredible journey over the last two years. So we started our program um, two years ago with um, a group of three of us. Unfortunately, Chris couldn't make it today. So three mums with five out of eight of our children have got a disability or a learning need. And so four out of the five of them, they attend mainstream school and mainstream programs. However, those mainstream, um, particularly sporting programs, were a bit of a challenge, a um, bit of a refusal, that sort of thing, weren't quite catering for them. So we, the three of us are netballers and love uh, playing a, a game of netball. So we started the program um, with a few come and try sessions and thought, OK, let's just see what happens here. Um, so within the first 
um, three weeks of come and try sessions. We had about 15 participants. So we thought, oh, okay, this is working. Um, and then as the, as the year continued, this was year one, we were running those on a Sunday morning. We had siblings join in, family join in, and it was this beautiful um, part of our weekend. So that was year one. By the end of year one, we had about 18 participants, a whole range of abilities, um, different learning needs, some social um, things going on for those kids as well. So then year two, we thought, okay, let's let's do something a little bit different. Let's challenge ourselves. So we had a, um, we thought if we're going to take this into the wider sphere, we would like them to represent Sandringham District Netball Association. So they're part of, you know, they're representing the association. So they should be part of our representative program. So we've got over a, um, 150 girls from um, under 11s up to opens that represent the association and we wanted to marry the two basically. So we included them, so moved from a Sunday morning to a Monday night when the rep program was coming and part of what we've done with the junior program in particular is we've included the rep girls as part of their coaching, um, part of the coaching program. So it's integration at its finest. Um, so we put it out there to the girls, said, you know, anyone want to come and take part in our um, All Abilities program, and then suddenly we had a wait list of girls that wanted to take part and, um, yeah, just be part of that. So what that enabled us to do was um, really hone in some of the skills of those netballers. We have a whole range of abilities, like I said, but um, we've got some really talented netballers. So with the one-on-one -on -one support that the rep girls were able to offer, we were able to really um, develop those netball skills of those individuals. So our junior program ran throughout the whole of last year, um, and we were, we were getting about 25 to 30 participants every Monday night, which was just um, absolutely fantastic. Netball Victoria came down, I just saw Tanya over there. Um, Netball Victoria came down a few times uh, and they've been super supportive of the program in doing that. So that's our, our junior program. I'm just... No, that's right. Um, I think I was just going to mention oh, sorry, also, I have um, uh, the culmination of that program last year um, was a spring tournament mirroring what was happening in the domestic competition as well. Um, so we had almost three teams, I think, playing in their own mini tournament on a Monday night, and that really gave them a sense of um, participation and feeling competitive within, uh, within their peer group um, as well, which was just amazing. We had also the ability, we all coached domestically, um, and so we had the ability to be able to go out amongst our domestic teams as well and perhaps look at some kids who, who might just need a little bit of extra support to maintain their, their competitiveness within the domestic team and we could bring some of those um, players into that spring competition as well um, where they could do some one-on-one -on -one skill development. So it really is an inclusive um, opportunity for the whole district um, across, across a number of different spheres. Um, from that program I think what we also really came to realise is that, that that program was targeting the youth within our community but there was definitely a gap for um, young adults um, and adults as they moved through. Um, and so we started up a program on a Friday morning with the support of an organisation within our community called Bailey House. Um, and we run an amazing program on a Friday morning for an hour and a half with Bailey House where we get um, a group of participants come down um, and we do some really fun activities um, with, those, with those adults. We have um, a good sort of 20 minutes of warm up, uh, we do some skills and drills and it's amazing to see the development of the participants over that, that's been running for sort of 12 to 18 months and I've been involved with that heavily for the last 12 months and got to know the people in the group really well and their participation and confidence through that skills and drills. Um, has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and just the, um, the improvement also that it gives with mobility um, and helps them with their activities of daily living as well. So people have got, um, got some real benefits out of that. I have to say the favourite part of the program for them is the game. They love the game play. We have 20 minutes of game play um, to half an hour of game play at the end of the session and everybody really gets involved in that and it becomes quite competitive. We're very well supported. So it's myself and another coach generally who run that, but we also have um, um, brought in support through CEDA. Um, so we have some, some young, um, young youth players who are working through CEDA who come down and volunteer their time as well. Um, and so they're very, the, the ratio for support in that program is great. Um, and that's, that's something that we'll, we'll definitely be focusing on this year. Um, through, similarly to how Em was just speaking in regards to the integration of the program within the community through the REP program, um, one of our targets for this year is to spread that across to our 
adult program as well. Um, so what opportunity is there within the community to tap into perhaps a senior program um, and marry the two up where everybody gets mutual mutual benefit and particularly for that game play, um, perhaps we could start looking at running some walking walking netball and things like that and, and bringing the two groups together. Um, so lots on the agenda for the adult program this year. Um, so like I said, as part of that youth program, um, bringing those rep players in, what we really found was um, we had the kids who come, come along every Monday night and they have their support from us and some of those um, rep, programs that rep players, they give one-on-one -on -one to support from those. But like I said, we've got some amazingly talented netballers and we were really able to develop them. So for the first time, we, um, as a Henderson region, we entered into the Netball Victoria state titles and um, we're now premiers of, the, um, of our state um, all, of, all abilities competition. But um, what we found, which was amazing, don't get me wrong, but what we found actually in that the all abilities division was we were um, probably the only team to have players under the age of 21. So um, the all abilities netball sphere is largely adult based. And so what we had was our um, some of our 10 year olds playing 10 year old girls with, you know, varying challenges up against adult men with other challenges. So um, we really felt as though that's something that we'd like to develop, looking at um, a youth-based all abilities program. So that's on our agenda, working with Netball Victoria and Netball Australia with that as well. Had some fantastic conversations with Netball Australia and we really felt as though um, it needed to be um, a youth-based program with peer-to-peer um, -peer competition, basically. So um, kids with anxiety and other issues don't need to be faced with a, a man with white line fever on a court. <laughs> Anyway, um, we thank you for the opportunity for coming to speak today. We were really lucky enough this year to win um, the Netball Victoria Inclusive Centre of the Year Award um, for our development over the last two years. Um, we've gone from naught participants, well, tell a lie, our five children, um, but um, we've gone grown to about 40 to 45 participants in two years. Um, we've got a few more coming along when we start up our common try sessions in a couple of weeks. We'll be putting them on AAA Play, wherever. Yes, thank you, we'll be in touch. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, so we really look, to, look into moving into our third year with some fantastic ideas for development. We've got brilliant support. Um, so yeah, we're excited, so thank you. We'll, um, we've got a little video um, which sort of showcases our program courtesy of Netball Victoria and our thing. passionate about all ability sport we've both got a child with a disability and in looking out there in the community um, there wasn't very much out there because netball's our passion we looked at how we could develop a program in netball for children who don't necessarily fit into the regular season or the regular yeah. games offer them a way to get involved so um, took a leap of faith and hey presto I've never met such a passionate pair of ladies in regards to a driving force of a program. This has actually drawn in extra parts of the community that have been missing out and it gets them into team sports as well. So I think that that's actually made us as an association grow. I love to run around, keep healthy and be fit and uh, yeah, I like to be free and do physical stuff. It makes me feel like pretty good being able to watch these kids develop their skills in like a sport that like I love to play. We've made friends, it's fun, you get a lot out of it. I just like running around and like playing different positions and seeing how it goes. I like just being outdoors. I think other associations around Victoria can actually learn from these two ladies and get other associations on board to do the same thing. It's like an absolute joy to come and be a part of it. You can just see these kids grow, develop. How can you not love being a part of, of that? It's, it's amazing. <laughs>
because it's volunteer life, um, Emily and Amelia have to run back to work, actually. And so they can't stick around for the panel. So we're going to switch things up at the moment. And we'll just do um, two minutes of questions right now. So if anyone is um, joining us online on the live stream, ask your questions now. We've got that 20 second delay. So we'll hopefully catch you at the end. Anyone um, in this room have a question for the ladies from Sandringham? Richard, uh, Grant's got the microphone. Hopefully it's, it's gonna work. Uh, yeah, hi, Richard Amon from Disability Sport and Recreation. Fantastic uh, program, congratulations on all you've done. It's just uh, fantastic to see the, the joy on the kids' faces and, and the numbers of participants growing and also the benefit that other people who've been involved with the program being able to get a better understanding and awareness of people with disability and what they can get out of sport is just fantastic. So I'd encourage you to nominate your project in the Victorian Disability Sport and Recreation Awards. Um, the nominations um, close in March, so I encourage you to go to the, the website www.dsr.org.au. A um, bit of a plug, but yeah, programs like that need to be recognised and celebrated and spread far and wide. So I um, congratulations and I encourage you. you to apply for an award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Hopefully, hopefully testing. Hopefully there's some. Um, hopefully there's some nominations that come out of the, <laughs> today. Is there? Another question, I'll run over. Thank you, um, Bron from Dynamics Australia. I'm just curious, obviously when you first got started, obviously there's not a lot of templates, particularly in this area around community sport. Um, whether you created your own or whether you did find it somewhere to help you get started, whether it be around risk and safety or um, getting parents to um, register or whatever it might be. I'd love to say there was loads of policies and procedures in place. <laughs> Unfortunately, there wasn't. We just flew by the seat of our pants. Um, we all coach at our local domestic club, so we do have working with children's checks. We are qualified coaches, so we do have that as our own, you know, personal qualifications. But we. Um, we created a flyer, literally, and we thought, right, okay, let's send it through our own networks, let's send it to our local schools and that sort of stuff. Um, and just thought, let's start it and see what happens. And then it, it just sort of snowballed from there. So year one was a massive learning curve, just in terms of, we, we actually never asked anybody what their disability or learning need was. We just um, felt as though, just come along. If you've seen the flyer and you want to participate, great let's just go with that so um yeah we had a couple of interesting sessions where you know we had a few bolters across the oval but that was all across the courts but that was all right um yeah but we we just we just really felt as though there was a need for it and uh, and had faith that if we started it by the right in the right way with the right um passion and the right um sort of i don't know the right seed then it would grow in the right way and it has so thank you I think, um, I think just in terms of uh, risk and, and mitigation as well, I think um, for anyone that was looking to start up a similar program, um, we've been so fortunate to be supported by our association, um, so by Sandringham and District um, Netball Association. And so what we would really love to see is that these sorts of programs spreading throughout all of the associations. They all run rep programs. I um, mean, wouldn't it be amazing within the Victorian community if we could see every rep program supporting an all abilities program as well um, with the support and insurance of the um, of the local association. One more question. Don't mean to put you on the spot, <laughs> but um, is the Furbank All Stars program still oh, yes. going on? And would you like to? give a quick overview of what that yeah, is. Yeah, I'm more than happy incredible. to do that. So I have a couple of hats, not just being my mum hat. Um, so part of what I'm passionate about is all ability sport and just having those same opportunities out there. So um, I run the netball program, but the other thing that I'm involved in is something called the All Stars Sport for All. So myself and another passionate parent, um, Lucy Waddell, um, we started a program, it would be 18 months ago now, um, whereby... Um, we, where it comes from, with, uh, as Sean mentioned, the, uh, the Furbank um, 
connection. We firmly believe that there was a lot of schools out there who had amazing facilities that should be used by the community as well for the greater good. So we um, approached Furbank and they said, yeah, yeah, program sounds great. So what we did was run a few sessions. So um, we we sort of thought there's, there's kids out there who they might be taking part in school athletics, but they, they had no idea what a shot put was, for example. So, um, so we'd give them a taster of something so that they could take that back into school or if they really loved it would be able to um, de develop that with local clubs so it, it, the idea behind it was a stepping stone program so we've had sort of 18 months of um, trial and error and testing and that sort of thing so um, we've learned along the way so what we have is different sporting associations that have come down um, and given a, t a tester so we generally do two or three sports um, each term so I've done the the netball part of it, but we've done, we've covered AFL, we've covered soccer, um, we've covered net, uh, obviously netball, um, softball, gymnastics, athletics, I'm trying to think what else I've covered. Um, so that's been in the last 18 months. So it's given the, the kids around um, a little taster of something. Um, so part of that program is, um, like I said, a stepping stone program and it's feeding into um, local um, associations or local clubs. So for example, the kids that took part in netball, they've obviously been able to come and take part in our program down there. Part of what we're developing this year with the All Stars is um, a soccer program, except I am English, so I'll call it football. Um, so the um, football program that we're developing is similar to our netball program, but obviously for those kids that really want to take part in a football program. So working with Future Football, they're a, an association that um, passionately believe, as, as we do, that there's opportunities out there. So they have got amazingly talented footballers as well in their realms, and they would like to see a similar um, integrated program. So that's on the horizon for this year as well, which is fantastic. Um, we've got Brighton Little Aths, who took an All Abilities stream through that as part of their competition season. Um, and then with, um, they'll be getting on board just prior to the um, multi-class events that they take part in their sc with School Sports Victoria. So they'll be uh, working with those kids before they enter into their school athletics carnivals and that sort of stuff. So Brighton Little Laughs have sort of taken their, that and run with it as well. Excuse that terrible pun. Um, so the <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> um, so it's so the All Stars is a stepping stone program, but as Amelia said as well, there's so many schools out there with fantastic facilities that could be used. Basically, it just requires personnel to to get up and run with that. As part of the All Stars, we similarly have some of those um, the Furbank girls. They um, take part of it in their, as part of their health and well-being program in their year eight. So they support those participants as well. So that's um, the idea of that. Is it will be used as a model for other schools to take to take that and, and go with that as well so thank you i've been a bit busy the last couple of years <laughs> very 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 busy um i don't know words have escaped me at the moment um it's hard to capture the power of the power of moms i think um they're absolutely incredible and when we look back over the decades especially within disability um, we know that it's parents. Typically, I go home around five o'clock and I switch off, and that's probably when parents and moms are just getting going, thinking about all this stuff. And so, whether it's Autism Victoria that started with the with four moms um, in the 50s or 60s, or whether it's the Sandringham program, or whether it's the Furbank program, I think it's absolutely incredible. And I love the way that the dots have been joined between a school, um, the adolescents and, and teenagers at the school volunteering in the sports, and then, as Emily said, having a stepping stone into other diverse opportunities, whether it's sport or recreation, anywhere in that community. So um, one gigantic thank you for Amelia Matlock and Emily Higgins. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Volunteer Life, they have to run back um, to work actually now. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your days to um, share your knowledge with us. Um, so that was Clubland. That was um, club level in Sandringham, not really that far from here. Um, and one other comment, um, which we'll put in the package that we'll send to everyone on Monday, is um, resources from Vic Sport and Play by the Rules. So if you are looking to create a new program, hopefully there's a little bit of a of a formula to follow. But we recognize that um, some of it you just like flying by the seat of your pants, I suppose. Um, 
So moving from club land towards state state land, um, very lucky to have April Wilson from Gymnastics Victoria presenting about what I think is one of the um, most interesting Together More Active programs that we've funded this year. Um, and I'll let, um, I'll let April explain that to you. Come on up, April. <laughs> Thank you, Sean, and thank you so much, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I know we've had a couple of presentations in a row and we might need to break, uh, wake your brains up a little bit. So something we do in kinder gym and in gymnastics is make sure that both sides of our brains, both hemispheres are working. And so we'll have a little bit of a challenge for you. Get you to place both hands out in front of you. And with one hand, give me a thumbs up. And with the other hand, Point your finger, and then when I say change, I want you to swap hands. Change. Now, the key here is to get both sides of your brain talking to each other and not to get finger guns. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. We'll see if we can get faster. Change. 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 OK, fantastic. Hopefully, you're a little bit more awake now. <laughs> Once you've mastered it, um, try to get other people to give it a go because you can feel really um, cocky in yourself that you've got the hang of it and they don't, which is what I just did. <laughs> so for those who I haven't met, my name is April Wilson. I'm the Inclusion and Programs Manager at Gymnastics Victoria, and I'm really excited to share the concept of this project with you today. Uh, before I start, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So you. Today I'll be speaking about one of our Together More Active projects which has been funded through Sport and Recreation Victoria and stepping away from the all abilities and disability sector, this is a project which targets um, young families, mothers and their children experiencing homelessness in Melbourne. So where this project came from, um, I would like to say it started and originated by being underpinned by some of the data and statistics we see here, which are quite startling, and I'll leave you to read those um, on your own as I'm speaking. But the, the reason this project came together is um, from anecdotal evidence. Um, I started working with St Vincent de Paul in a volunteer capacity on Sunday nights five years ago um, on their soup van program. And I would go and still do go out on a Sunday night starting in North Melbourne and working my way down through the city um, towards Crown Casino and back up again, stopping at various, various places to serve food to people who are doing it tough, doing it rough um, on the streets. And I think starting that volunteer opportunity, what I found most startling was that what I imagined um, someone experiencing homelessness to look like and what the image is that I'm sure a lot of us have in our heads is generally a middle-aged to older gentleman who's sitting on the side of the road on the footpath um, who's asking you for money. And while that is sometimes what I see, um, often what I'm seeing is uh, women, people with a disability, a huge amount of international students, and also just parents who are approaching us for something to put in their child's lunchbox for the next day. And so very quickly I started to see that um, very easily in the people that I was serving, I could also see my mum or my sister and my beautiful three-year-old niece, my friend or even myself in the same position. So what is the project actually about? Um, what we are intending to do is work off a pilot that came about uh, two years ago where all of the stars aligned. I had this passion for working with Melbourne's homeless community and we were also approached by a young woman working at Launch Housing in South Melbourne who had a group of women experiencing homelessness um, and their children who were interested in trying a new social activity. And what we did is we connected them with the local gymnastics club, Melbourne Gymnastics Centre on Punt Road in Windsor. And in the school holidays, we would run a kinder gym program that was specifically for um, children who are experiencing homelessness or who are in crisis accommodation or transitional housing to be able to come along and participate in some fundamental movement activities. 
It took a little while for that pilot to sure up. Um, sure enough, in the first session that we ran, where we were expecting six or seven families, we only had one because a great number of those mothers were called into court that day to speak um, as part of their ongoing domestic violence situations. But as the program has continued over the past two years, we've seen more trust grow in the program, more families come, and now that program is sustainable and um, something that continues to run. Essentially, what we're trying to do with this fantastic opportunity from Sport and Recreation Victoria is to replicate that program model, um, partnering our gymnastics clubs with housing services and homelessness services across the state, um, where we can run kinder gym programs, fundamental exercise and movement programs for children under the age of five who are experiencing either homelessness or significant financial disadvantage. In terms of why kinder gym, um, kinder gym is not a magical cure-all sport, um, but what it is, is it's year-round, you don't need any background or any previous ability to be able to do it, and you don't need to purchase any equipment. So we like to think that it's quite accessible. And we know that there are a number of um, disadvantages and implications for children experiencing disadvantage and homelessness in terms of their development, um, their ability to form relationships with peers, their growth and their physical development, um, and what we see is that Kinder Gym is able to combat a lot of those, um, those detriments that we're seeing for that population group. In terms of our project scope, we have the two years in, of initial funding where we hope to target 13 clubs um, across the state. We've had a look at the homelessness pre um, prevalence data in Melbourne and some of the targeted areas that we're focusing on are Dandenong, uh, Caulfield, Paran, Albert Park, and also regionally Shepparton, Geelong, and Ballarat. We'll be focusing on that under five age group and partnering with, as I mentioned, partnering clubs with local housing and homelessness services. We'll also be looking at organisational competency in terms of Gymnastics Victoria's education on this population group and club level education, and assisting our clubs to have sustainable financial hardship um, policies and procedures in place so that when this funding runs out, um, these programs can still continue. We've been very fortunate to already have a number of organisations jump at the opportunity to work with us in regards to this project. And that's fantastic because even though I volunteered in the homelessness sector for quite some time, it is still completely new. Um, it's a completely different beast, one that I'm not very familiar with. So thankfully, we have Launch Housing on board with their 14 sites across Victoria. The Council to Homeless Persons um, has also stepped up in terms of offering us education. And later this month, we'll have them come out, both workers and people with lived experience of homelessness in Melbourne, to educate our board and management team to give us a little bit more of an idea about how to approach this project. Um, thank you to the RSAs in the room, Valley Sport um, in Shepparton and Leisure Networks down in Geelong have already put up their hands to support the local clubs in their areas who are interested in getting involved in this and also the statewide children's resource program. Now, we've already identified um, quite a few challenges that we're going to um, come across, and that's okay. Um, that is part and parcel with dealing with a sector that I'm not overly familiar with, but one that I'm very passionate about. And the first challenge that I've found is that the data um, varies very significantly depending on the service that you're speaking to. So what is reported by launch housing, what's reported by the census and what's reported by St Vincent de Paul, for example, all very much vary depending on the services that they offer and also on the areas that they offer those services in. So for us, being able to find data that is accurate and relevant um, to underpin this project will be a challenge. It brings to mind um, a research project which was done a couple of years ago in Melbourne where um, they reported a significant decrease in Melbourne's homelessness um, prevalence. But when you looked into the methods that they used to find that data, they had actually just sent out some researchers onto the streets of Melbourne to physically headcount the people that they could see sleeping rough on the side of the street, which we know is not um, necessarily the most accurate way to collect data. In terms of organisational competency, as I mentioned, we'll need to make sure that our board and our management team are fully aware of the different challenges and sensitivities that we need in working with this population group. 
We also need to understand that for people who are experiencing crisis or who are in transition accommodation situations, that sport is not necessarily a priority to them. And we've already found that certainly in the pilot programs that we've run, that if there is a court clash or a clash with a um, housing appointment, that priority will drop and um, sport will certainly not be the first thing on the radar. And so it will be up to us to educate our clubs and our coaches and the people attending the program to help them understand the benefits to their children. Project sustainability, as I mentioned, funding doesn't last forever. And so it will be very important for our clubs to make sure that they have processes in place to help people who are experiencing financial hardship whether that is through um, structured fundraising programs or through other means, we'll be working with our clubs to do so. And also recognising that within the population group we're targeting, that privacy is of utmost importance. In terms of the outcomes that we're hoping for, we're looking to have 13 clubs delivering this pilot across the next two years and to have 100% of those clubs on board, making sure that they're thinking ahead with sustainability and supporting people within their community experiencing financial hardship. We're looking for 260 participants to engage in gymnastics and hopefully we'll have up to 200 coaches um, and other personnel undertake coaching and, sorry, education and professional development in the area. And so I'll leave you there with my email address. If this is an area that is a passion to you as well, I would love to hear from you whether you're from um, the sector or not. As I said, it's a new area for me, um, but please get in touch and hopefully we'll see this um, pilot get started not too long from now. I think over the last couple of years, I've attended a lot of forums. Um, I've organized a couple, attended a couple, and I think that is one of the first um, projects specific to homelessness. Um, and I think it's an incredible um, project that has connected the dots. You can see all of the partners that are involved in that. I'm sure that working for um, Sport and Recreation Victoria, we're not supposed to have favorite projects. But if we were allowed to have favorite projects, I think that might be near the top. So um, one big thank you to April. That's a, an amazing project and a fantastic presentation. So we've gone from Clubland to the SSA, and now we're going to go nationally to the Australia. Oh, got to switch um, presentations. Pete had so many beautiful photos from the camps that um, crashed my computer. So I had to keep it separate. But um, we'll welcome up Pete Griffiths from the Australian Camps Association uh, while that loads up. Come on up, Pete. It worked. Oh. Excellent. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm here from the Australian Camps Association, and how do I make this go forward, Sean? Okay. One of the projects we're doing is uh, called the Great Getaways, and uh, it's basically camp programs for people over the age of 55. Um, we've chosen the word great getaways rather than camp because camp often means to a lot of people sleeping on the ground or being uncomfortable or even from some folks from other parts of the world, um, camp can be something completely different to how we imagine it. So great getaways it is. First of all, a bit about us. Uh, we are an association of member camps around the country and we really represent three uh, groups. One is the actual uh, people out there who want to get access to camps. And in this room, there are folks who have children at school who go to school camps. There are people who are part of family groups who go to camps, people who are part of clubs that go to camps, people with disabilities go to camps and so forth. So it's not just school camps. But we also look after our members to make sure that they are able to deal with all those folks when they get to camp. So in the case of the Great Getaways, making sure the camps themselves are set up to deal with older folk. Older folks are very loose term, and I'll come back to that a bit later on. So the context for us, some pretty obvious stuff here. Um, people over the age of 55, which I don't consider old by the way, um, really are a growing group. A lot of those folks uh, grow each year. And we know that in the future it's going to be a very significant part of the population. So part of this program is based on trying to keep those folks fit and active and independent as long as possible, and therefore out of the healthcare system. Um, what we have found is that even though folks are living longer, 
the proportion of their life uh, lived healthily is not increasing. So your latter years are actually not your best years. And this is part of trying to make sure that as you get older, you remain um, as well as you can do. So, uh, apparently seven out of 10 older Australians are overweight or obese. Um, most are not sufficiently active and that's 30 minutes a day. We also know that loneliness and social isolation actually does impact on your health and will it contribute to early death. So being uh, active, being socially connected is a really important part of improving your physical and mental well-being and that's the purpose of our camps. So we ran a whole bunch of pilot programs and I should say before I go any further that innovation is a really um, unusual word. All this stuff is not new. From my own experience, I know that folks are running camps for older people in the 80s, 1980s. What is new is the fact that this program has managed to live on beyond the funding cycle. And the Together More Active funding, which we have received for part of this, is being used to roll this program outside of Melbourne into initially Ballarat and then around the rest of the state. So the initial findings really were from a co-design workshop uh, these are the main motivators um, that older folks uh, put forward about being on camp. Improved physical fitness. So um, folks might have read in the paper recently that uh, folks have an idea of their own physical health as being about 15 years younger than they actually are. So I'm whatever age I am and I feel like I'm 15 years younger than that. But in reality, I'm actually my physical age. So the heads up is that folks think they're fitter than they are. Going on camp and trying some of these activities is a bit of a benchmark activity for them to say, well, actually, I've got to lift my game. <coughs> uh, being outside in nature is actually obviously a great uh, outcome. Being with people who you uh, feel safe with, so being with like-minded people is important. Um, generating memories you can look back on in, in, a, in a pleasant way with nostalgia is important. Being with folks of similar interests. Um, and we were surprised to find, I wasn't, but some folks were surprised to find that older people are up for anything. And I think we sort of made the assumption that as you get older, you become less active and more timid, perhaps. Um, that's definitely not the case. Anyone know what a pamper pole is? It's a big, tall pole, like a telegraph pole, you climb up, and there's a rope in front of you with a, a ball in space. And you've got to leap off that pole and touch the ball. Obviously, you're in a harness and a rope a rope's set up so you don't fall to your death. But um, the idea is to get up there and have a crack. It's very challenging. Um, we've had plenty of folks in their 80s do that, and the folks who run the camps are um, shocked they actually can manage to do that. I don't know why. It's probably a little bit of ageism. So the, age of the, the aims of the camps are, as I said, to benchmark axle versus perceived flexibility, strength, and endurance, and encourage long-term change. So it's no good just going and saying, actually, I need to change. We need to monitor folks as they progress through the, the, the years to follow. Form social connections. So folks who are, um, for whatever reason, socially isolated through culture, perhaps they've lost a partner, perhaps they've moved states, perhaps they're estranged from their families. Um, we need to get them out of their houses and, and back with um, a good social connected group. Of course, seeing a great part of the country and the wonderful thing about uh, camps around the country is they generally are in great places if they're not being burnt down or, um, in New South Wales's case, the one that was burnt down a couple of weeks ago has now been flooded. So uh, apparently the locusts are on their way for next week. Um, and just enjoy some time outside. I'm going to play this short video.
I asked my mate Brian on the ukulele and singing his uh, 80-something and still a disgrace, so that's good. Um, so what we're really trying to do here is give people the um, knowledge and the skills and the endurance to prevent themselves having a fall, ultimately, because we know that one, lead, one fall leads to another one. So a lot of the activities are focused on balance and strength. Um, just a little quote there. Now, it's not all about adventure. There's still plenty of time to chat and play ukulele badly. Um, and that idea of forming social connections is really core to the whole program. It is a, a partnership. We don't deliver the program. Our member camps do that. My job is to get the groups together and take them out to the camps themselves. That camp was Marysville, for those who've been to Marysville. So a few things are working well. Some aren't so well. This is the stuff that's working well. The duration. The camps go to between two and four days. A really good mix of active and um, passive activities. The funding model um, is now at the point where it's self-sufficient, so we're not reliant on uh, government support to keep it going. The funding we do have is about promoting it in other parts of the state. You need to have a leader, of course, to make sure that someone knows where to go. We've got great uh, word of mouth happening out and about. A great age mix, so the youngest person out there is in their late 50s and the oldest person is in their early 90s at the moment. I mean, that's another reason of saying uh, older folks is such a stupid expression because that's a pretty much a 35-year gap. So there's an incredible diversity there. Great natural surrounds. It's important to connect to the local community, so the Marysville crew do get involved with uh, the, the local Marysville people. Um, increased activity, social networking. And seeing those goals and trying to then beat them. The things we can improve, it's becoming clear as we get through this program now in its fourth year, incorporation is important. So if you think of a camp, a lot of folks will think of something fairly rustic. Um, and we try to make sure the camps we go to are comfortable. We don't use top bunks, for example. Uh, often there's en suites, so we're not using community bathrooms. The actual staff at the camps are important because many of them work with younger people day in, day out, and to convert yourself from talking to 12-year-old uh, children to 80-year-old adults takes a bit of a leap, especially if you're in the early 20s yourself. That's important to be able to manage that different interaction. The gender balance, well, um, it might not surprise anyone, but most of the folks who go on camp are women, and it may be because they're more adventurous, or it may be because they live a little longer, Maybe because the men are so stubborn they won't go anywhere. So we're really trying to get some of the older men out and about doing things without it turning into a dating agency. <laughs> what happens on camp stays on camp. Um, and it's all very well to say uh, we're getting folks out and about, but we are trying to get hold of those folks who don't have the financial capacity to go out and do things. And, um, and the little old folks who don't get out of their houses. A lot of the people who come on these programs are already pretty active. So that's good, but it's not really what we're after. Sometimes I get a phone call saying, oh, I can't come on this camp next week because I'm busy rafting the Amazon or I'm trekking Machu Picchu or something. And you kind of go, well, you don't need to go on camp anyway. So I want to make sure we get hold of those folks who do need to go. For us, um, it's about extending the program beyond metropolitan Melbourne and beyond Victoria for that matter. I'm going to leave you with two little short stories. And the first one came from a lady who rang the other day to say, I can't come on the next camp because um, I've decided to join a, a tour to uh, the Middle East. And I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't learnt how to be independent and didn't gain the uh, confidence from going on camp from the last couple of experiences. And the second one is from a lady who, um, in the feedback forms that follow the camp, when asked if she was resilient, said, no, I know I'm already resilient. I'm resilient because I lived through the 2009 bushfires in King Lake and lost my family in my home. And this camp hasn't made me more resilient because I'm already far too resilient as it is. But what it has brought me is joy. And it's given me the capacity to go back to my home in the community in King Lake again for the first time since 2009 and reconnect with my friends up there now. So that's a, that to me is a really important outcome. So I'm going to leave you with that. Um, if you want to know more about it, I'll be, I'll be happy to rabbit on forever, but I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank Thanks. you. Um, I'd like to invite up um, perhaps Sam, Rachel, and April.
please, to join Pete um, for a short panel discussion in case there's any questions that we have in the audience or online. Um, just while we do that, I think that um, it's very poignant how Pete ended um, looking back at the 2009 um, bushfires at King Lake, um, resilience, and the thing that matters, I think, for most of our lives is just joy. It's just, um, it's a really interesting sort of process that a lot of us go through, um, especially looking into research, and we want to know things like, does participation in sport make you smarter, healthier, et cetera, et cetera? But of all the outcomes that we could probably measure, I think that joy is probably the most important one, and so a fantastic um, way to end the camp's presentation. We, as with all forums that I seem to organize, are a little bit behind time, but we'll live with it um, because the content is just so good um, and I'm so disorganized. But um, we have time for a few questions, um, either from this room or online. Who, who would like to be first? Hi, um, my question is for April. Um, I was wondering, um, given your experience working with suit bands and now your experience working um, with gym, gymnastics um, facilities around, how close are the suit bands to the gymnastic facilities? And is there an opportunity, if they're not within close proximity, to potentially um, have suit bands set up there? Um, they're uh, growing up. I remember my mom says, "If you feed them, they will come." So if you put the suit band close to where your activity is, there might be a, a way to link that in and show them how truly accessible it is. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Um, and certainly, I'm working within my networks with St. Vincent de Paul to try to get their support for this program. And with the limited contact that I've been able to have in a short period of time. Um, even the anecdotal advice and evidence from people who are out on the suit van and telling me which spots to target has been enormously helpful. Um, I'm only working on one van, which is the North Melbourne Fitzroy suit van, so it covers only five or six sites across Melbourne, but there's many, many more um, that cover different sites, so it will be important for me to, to get that information, and I agree, food is a great draw. Um, with the pilot that's been running in Windsor, um, after the session is complete, the family sit down and have lunch together. So not only is it a physical activity opportunity for the children, but it also creates a support network between the mothers or fathers as well. I volunteer at the Collingwood um, St. Vincent de Paul Soup Van, so if you need to cover that side of things, um, let me yes, know. Yes, please. I'd be, be happy, to, <laughs> happy to get the word out for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Fabulous new connection. Good. Um, next question. Um, my question is also for April. Um, given your project um, is definitely more about the social impact and the differences um, that it would make, and I guess more so than the number of people that participate, um, what are your plans to collect that social impact, and as Sean was just saying, the joy to be able to then share that with your funding body internally, and I guess this sort of room? Absolutely. I think we realised very early on um, with that very first pilot session that we ran where a huge number of the people we were expecting weren't able to participate because of other priorities is that this is definitely going to be a quality over quantity type project. So you're spot on there. I think through telling stories, through case studies is probably going to be the best way for us to share the good work that's been done by our gymnastics coaches and to be able to share the different benefits that are being um, achieved by the participants um, through the eyes of both participants and through their parents and carers as well. Because there are so many and such a wide variety of benefits that are social, that are emotional, that are physical, um, it will definitely be a case of storytelling. Hmm. I have a very important question for Pete. Have there been, um, with your sort of camps Tinder, um, ha have there been any new relationships um, <laughs> form? Uh, you wanted to join us, Sean? No. <laughs> Just asking for a friend. <laughs> uh, I'm not a liberty to say, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, there's, there's been plenty of great connections, um, not just between men and women or, or couples, but uh, just a lot of friendship groups formed, yeah. a lot of new social groups formed, a lot of folks going on to take up cycling and uh, 
table tennis and whatnot. So from the point of view of social connection, absolutely. From the point of view of what happens after hours, um, you'll have to wait for the other video to come out <laughs> on my uh, blocked YouTube channel. All right. And I think what's really interesting, the activity-based socialization. So I was really um, interested to hear that there's far more women involved than men, because I thought especially men maybe are more um, attracted to activity-based socialization. But um, and I was able to attend a DWA camp, which was awesome to ski and snowboard with the participants and the volunteers. But the magic happened sort of at night with the conversations between everybody. And I guess you guys have the same sort of campfire, just chill time, where everyone just debriefs. Uh, well, first of all, I think um, I don't want to be too sexist, but I do think some of the older guys prefer to end up in the men's sheds, for example. Yeah. And that's how they connect. Um, and if they do come out, it's often because they've been dragged out by their partners. Um, although I have had a couple of gentlemen ring up and say, um, um, if I come on this camp, are there going to be other women there? And of course the answer is yes, but that goes back to the first question. Um, as far as camps go, I guess most folks would have an experience of camp. And you're right, the best part of camp happens after the activities, sitting around chatting around the fire or over a glass of red in this case. So that social part of it really is the bit that really we... Um, enjoy the most. It's fantastic. Another question out there. Um, Nick's got an, uh, on the far side, if you can run over without tripping on any cords, Grant. Thank you. Um, my question is for all three of you. Um, as you mentioned, Pete, quite often a lot of the people who really need these programs, and all three of the presentations that you did were really amazing, but quite often the people that really need them um, either are reluctant to do so or, or, or are not aware that they're happening. Um, so many people are, are not as active on you know, the internet and social media as maybe all of us are in this room. So I was just wondering, I guess for all of you, do you have any ideas of how you actually you know, go out into the community and, and spread awareness and get people involved? My turn, all right. Um, that's a really great question, because I think it is about targeting people who aren't already active, and that's a really key target group. Um, we obviously work in a lot of promotional channels. So we try and get the word out there in as many platforms as possible to make it accessible online in that way. We also work, um, we get lots of calls from case managers or support workers um, who have heard about us through word of mouth from other staff. Um, and just sort of call up and ask what our service is, and once they hear about it, they think, oh, fantastic, and they can then refer us on or um, find activities for their clients and all of that. Um, in terms of um, finding more hard to reach people, so I, um, AAA Play is a part of RecLink, which does a lot of work with agencies who um, work with people experiencing disadvantage or vulnerability and work with the agency to then work with their clients or participants to bring people in. And I think that's a really powerful way of, of accessing those groups um, rather than just going out there and hoping that they will come, really working with those people to find out what they want um, rather than just saying, this is what you need, finding sort of a community-minded aspect of, of how to organise a program. April might have more to say on that. <laughs> I think that's a challenge that we're all very much faced with. Um, and this is an example that I think I've used before that if I go and join a new sport tomorrow, it doesn't really matter because I've got disposable income, I've got um, flexibility of time, I've played sport my whole life. But those hard to reach people or people that have been out of sport and rec or people that have experienced bullying, people that have experienced um, um, homophobic um, language, racist language, sexist, ableist language. That's the really hard group to re-engage. Um, and it looks like you've got another comment to follow up, Sam. Yeah, just a very, very good point. That's another reason we ask all of you guys for very detailed information about contacts for each of the programs and what to expect when they get there. So it sort of breaks that barrier of um, lack of knowledge down which is, and fear of judgment. So they have someone that they know they've contacted and I've spoken to and know what to expect because I think a lot of people are very wary of going into a new situation like that, especially if they've already experienced vulnerability in other areas. So that information from all of you guys really helps in that as well. And that's what I loved about um, back in November, we heard from Grigsby, I forget her first name, I'm so sorry, um, Roller Derby, that the first session of Roller Derby, they don't even do roller derby. They just hang out and have a coffee and just chat and build that relationship first. So 
Um, did you have a comment, April? That's why you're taking the microphone. Yeah, um, just a quick one. Definitely for us it will be the partnerships with the different homelessness and housing services that will be most important for us to be able to reach the people that we need to reach. Um, and to be very clear on who we're targeting, homelessness is not just people sleeping rough on the streets, it's also people in um, rental accommodation, transition housing or crisis accommodation that we're trying to reach as part of that overall um, homelessness population. So um, it's, it's definitely through partnerships that we'll be aiming to reach the people who need us most. It's fabulous. So um, it is actually the biggest challenge of all, I think, for us because it's the most important part of the work, isn't it, to get to the folks who don't have access to whatever the facility is. But we try and partner as well with good organisations like Rotary, local councils. Um, uh, there's active AG ambassadors we, we talk to around the state. Uh, I don't want to get involved in um, means testing people. So I prefer to say to people like Rotary, you tell us who needs to come along, we'll fundraise for that person, rather than get involved in who's got the wherewithal and who hasn't. But uh, I think we'll be successful when we have access to all those people and they have access to the service rather than just the, the top crew. Um, one last question. Set, is there anything online? Nope, we're good. We'll go back to Nick for the last question before we have a little break. Do you have got the um, microphone? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm um, sorry, I should have pointed who Nick was. <laughs> um, my next question is for Sam. Um, I was just wondering, um, having had a play with um, AAA um, mm -hmm. um, Players website um, and recognizing that, the, that through this promotion and networking, um, you'll probably get a, an uptake of, of, um, of activities that want to be a part of this. I'm um, just looking at um, the Metro Inner North. You said most people don't um, look by sport. So when I go select sport, all sports, you've already got 750 that pop up just in NML, which is fantastic. Um, filtering them. So uh, oftentimes people want to look for things where their inclusion, for instance, accessibility, um, or maybe over 55, um, just to make sure they're included in it. A lot of the programs will say kids, which calls out to kids. But I guess when you're filtering down through so many programs, um, is there any plans to expand on filtering so that people can find one that they're, they can be sure that um, they're going to be included in? Yeah, great question. You've sort of anticipated our future developments on the website. Um, that is really important. Um, it's sort of determining what filters we've put in. So some great suggestions there if anyone else has any as well. Um, I think we've got 750 total, so it maybe not, had, didn't filter quite for that area because we were originally just Metro and now we've expanded to all of Victoria. Um, but yeah, that is a really good point and stay tuned. Yeah. And um, I think, yeah, we all have sort of a vision uh, for the future for AAA play and following the evaluation that was completed, as Rachel said, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and it's always a nice reminder knowing that AAA play is, is essentially it's Sam and Set, I think. It's two people um, who do an incredible um, mountain of work and, and who are always um, willing to help me with very random requests. Um, all of last year, they were incredible with the live streaming. And um, today's fantastic. We got My Sport Live, so Sam and Set can half chill, but end up presenting and doing Facebook Live, so that's all good. Um, a huge thank you for our presenters, along with Amelia and Emily, um, who presented earlier. A uh, big thank you to April Wilson, Peter Griffiths, and Samantha Marshall. Thank you, guys. <laughs> While they make their way back, I'd just like to um, invite up Adam Walton, um, who will run us through the networking activity. Anyone who attended um, our economic inclusion um, forum last year, you might have met um, and heard Amelia Stewart and Santos um, speak, and they were from the RISE program. And we've been extremely lucky to um, steal Adam away from the RISE program um, on a secondment with our diversity and inclusion team for the next few weeks, hopefully. Um, while Adam does that, I'll bring up the um, link for the networking bingo. Welcome, Adam. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today. It's a pleasure to be here. So as Sean mentioned, I came from the RISE at DHHS program. It started about almost three years ago, and it was a program to give people on the autism spectrum an opportunity to get a foothold and an entry-level position in the public service. 
And it's given us so many great opportunities for networking and meeting people from all across government sectors. And finding us um, opportunities to go into areas of the government which we are interested in. And um, currently, as Sean mentioned, I am seconded to the Sports and Rec Diversity and Inclusion Team. And it's been a great experience so far. Um, so we started with um, eight people, myself included, back in 2017. And now the program's expanded. And we have 20 people currently employed through the program, which is great. And some of us have been poached by other departments. So about four of us went to Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, which is situated next door to us. And um, other departments have shown an interest in having similar programs at their departments. Um, so as a person with lived experience of autism, I can certainly understand how people at conferences are sometimes reluctant to talk to pe new people outside of their cohort. So the next opportunity, which I'm pleased to present, is enc to encourage people to speak to new people and um, learn from skills from them. So it's designed to get you up and get you mingling. Um, no pressure, just a lighthearted activity. And don't neglect the online participants because they've got some valuable wisdom too. Um, checking with the live stream viewers to hear their perspective. Um, Sean's loading up the questions now. So Sean and I were designing this the other day. Hopefully it will be fun for everyone. So thanks and enjoy everyone. Thank you. Pleasure, thank you. It's not the prettiest slide ever, but, um, but hopefully it works. Um, so just, if you'd like, um, as Adam said, it's very lighthearted. It's just a little bit of fun. Um, certainly a lot of us, we go to conferences, networks, uh, we just end up talking to the same three or four people, maybe, um, whether you want to talk to them or not sometimes. Um, and so I think this is a great way. We've just loaded up. We've done our best to go paperless. So instead of having like a bingo sheet that you would fill in, um, we'll ask everyone to just go to the Survey Monkey link that's on the screen. Um, and you can um, just fly through some of those questions. Some of the questions are really um, straightforward. And then some of the questions, you're going to have to seek out somebody. You might have to find a Vicsport rep, or you might have to find a DSR rep or you might have um, had to have listened to some of the previous presentations. We will come back um, at 1.30, so we got um, 40, 40 whole minutes. The, just a reminder that the washrooms are outside to the right and then around to the left. Um, feel free to walk outside if you like. There's um, some tables outside, etc. And you'll also see that the diversity and inclusion team, we've hung up um, a couple of lists of the Together More Active funded projects. Um, however, somehow we've forgotten um, to print the women and girls spreadsheet. So that will be Grant on the, oh, you found it. The, the computer is sitting on a chair right underneath this one. Awesome. So the computer on the chair. Um, and we'll have the spreadsheet. And then as you go around, um, ideally, everyone's had the time to take a highlighter and color in their um, name tags to represent the cohorts that they work with predominantly. Um, if you haven't, give it a go. We don't know how it'll work. It's the first time we tried it. Um, so have a look, because those projects, especially finding out who's who, who else is working in those spaces. And I think the predominant theme that really came through most clearly this morning was the value of partnerships and that value of working together to achieve that shared goal. So thank you, everybody. We'll take a 40-minute break. We'll come back at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>